Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Dome to Home. We are so excited to be here with you today uh, to talk about all sorts of cool stuff about satellites and looking at the Earth and all sorts of fun stuff like that. As always, I am Tara. I'm a CU alum and a planetary scientist and a FISC presenter here and also your host for Dome to Home today, along with Miss Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Yeah, hi, hope you guys are doing all right. I love talking about satellites. They're so cute and they give us such awesome information. So I'm excited to get started and teach you guys some stuff today. Yeah. So, and as always, we have our question master hiding in the background. Miss Emily is back there. Uh, so if you have any questions at any point throughout the show, you can either drop those in the chat here on the YouTube, or if you have problems with the YouTube chat, there's also a link to a Google form that's down in the uh, description of the episode. So you should be able to access that and you can put your questions in there. Emily can see them both. We'll try to answer some as we go along if you have any. Otherwise, we do have time scheduled at the end of the show where we can address those questions too. So go ahead and just drop them in whenever you think of them and we'll get to it. Also, if at any point you have trouble seeing the screen, if some of the images look a little small or fuzzy, try going full screen with your YouTube. It makes it nice and big and bright and you can see it really well. I think that's all of our fine print. Anything else we're missing, Amanda? Uh, I don't believe so. Make sure you say hi to us if you're with us today. Yeah, <laughs> we always love hearing from you. All right, so today we are here talking still about our Earth and how we use satellites to look at the Earth, but in particular today we are talking about upcoming missions that are going to be launching satellites to study the Earth. So these are things that haven't happened quite yet, but they are on the horizon pun not intended, <laughs> but they're coming up and they're going to do some really cool stuff. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get into the satellites themselves, I thought we'd take a second to kind of review something called the electromagnetic spectrum. If you've been with us here on Dome to Home before, you've probably heard that word or those words a couple of times, and you may be really familiar with the EM spectrum and all of that because we've told you several times. But if you've missed it, we're going to do a quick review. Because what the electromagnetic spectrum is, is just what you see here, different kinds of light and how we use different kinds of light to see different things. Now, this is one of the most important things that we do with satellites and telescopes and just in astronomy in general. By looking at, with, at things with different kinds of light, we can see different things. So this image here just shows you the whole electromagnetic spectrum, all of the different wavelengths of light or kinds of light. And you can see if you look really closely in the middle, that little portion where it says visible light, where the little rainbow is, you can see that's a very, very, very small part of the whole big spectrum of light that exists. So the stuff that we see with our eyes is just a tiny, tiny piece of all of the different kinds of light that are out there. And we have telescopes and satellites and cameras and things that can detect all these different kinds and kind of convert them into light that we can see using computers, which is pretty awesome. And this is a very important technique, especially for some of these satellites we're talking about today when we're looking at the Earth, because some of them can measure different things that tell us a lot about what we're looking at. So that's that. Let's get into talking about some of these satellites. So here we are on the Earth. We're looking up at the sky. You can see the sun right there in the middle. Let's go ahead and launch off the Earth and go uh, check it out from space. We'll pretend that we're a satellite. Yeah, absolutely. We can maybe see them floating all around. So make sure everybody's got their helmets on, air tanks all full. We are going on a space ride. So there is our big, beautiful Earth underneath us looking lovely. So if you were maybe on a satellite, this might be a view that you would see. So the first one that we want to talk about is this really awesome satellite called Landsat 9. So you can think land, satellite, Landsat. And this is Landsat 9. So you might guess that yes, there have been eight other Landsat satellites. This is the ninth one that is launching. It's supposed to launch later this year in September of 2021. 
Now, Landsats are really amazing satellites. We've been launching these Landsats for 44 years. That was when the first one launched 44 years ago. So you can probably imagine we have crazy amounts of data from all of these Landsat satellites. Now Landsat 9 in particular has a couple of really neat things going for it and a couple of cool objectives. Now the satellite itself, what you're looking at here, I'm happy to say was designed by Northrop Grumman right here in Boulder, Colorado. And one of the instruments that it's using, its visible light camera, was built by Ball Aerospace, also right here in Boulder. So we're directly connected to the satellite that's going to be launching in a couple of months. So that's pretty cool. But it's also going to be um, using two different instruments to look at the Earth. It has the one camera that Ball built that uses the visible light, just like our eyes do, just taking pictures of the ground, basically. But it also has another instrument that uses thermal infrared. So when we we're looking at that whole big long spectrum, the infrared one is just a little bit longer wavelengths than visible light. So we can't see it with our eyes. But one thing that infrared is really good for is detecting heat. Maybe you've been to Fisk before, back in the, in the before times and you saw our infrared camera, it's kind of like having heat vision. So we can use infrared to detect heat. And you can probably imagine that's good for a lot of different observing that we're doing here on the Earth, especially when we're talking about observing things related to things like climate change. We want to know where the Earth is getting warmer so we can use our thermal infrared cameras to do stuff like that. Now Landsat 9 is particularly cool because it has really amazing resolution. You can imagine 44 years ago, the pictures we were taking of the Earth were a little fuzzy, a little blurry. We didn't get a ton of detail, but with Landsat 9, it's going to be taking pictures on the scales of 15 meters, which is about 50 feet. So from all the way up in space, hundreds and hundreds of miles up in space, it can see something as small as 50 feet. And that's really helpful for us. That helps us to measure changes that are happening on the earth, but that are happening on like human scales. So we could build a building in this satellite 200 miles up in the air would see it. I think that's pretty cool. It's also gonna be used for monitoring things like tropical deforestation, urban expansion, water use, coral reef degradation, glacier retreat, natural disasters. The whole list goes on and on and on. But another really cool thing, and maybe my favorite thing about the Landsat satellites is all of their data becomes available to the public fairly quickly. So you can go online and we're gonna do this right now and show you how to do it and all the cool stuff that's on there. There's a thing called Earth Observatory. And I think we're gonna link the, uh, put the link down there in the chat or the description there for you so you can check it out on your own. It's just earthobservatory.nasa.gov. So Ms. Amanda's gonna share a screen and take us over there so we can check out some of the cool things you can do with Earth Observatory. I actually don't think I'm able to take <gasps> us over there today, oh, no. unfortunately. Oh, no. mm -hmm. But you guys should definitely take some time to check that website out. It's really neat. Yeah, absolutely. Because it takes pictures of certain things from all the way from the first, some of them all the way back to the first Landsats from 40 years ago. They'll take pictures of the same area over and over and over. And so you can see how it changes with time. And so some of them have time-lapse videos that you can watch. Some of them have little sliders you can go back and forth. And there's pictures of things from all over the world. I was looking at mining in South Africa the other day, glacial retreat in the Antarctic, all sorts of really cool stuff. So highly recommend checking that out, earthobservatory.nasa.gov. That's a really fun one. So our second satellite that... <laughs> Ooh, I squeaked there. <laughs> Our second satellite that we're going to look at is uh, one that's a little bit different. It's a little more specific. It's called PACE because, of course, we love our acronyms in astronomy. PACE stands for the Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem. So, as you might guess, this one is specifically looking at plankton, aerosols, clouds, and the ocean. Pretty self-explanatory. This one's gonna launch in March of 2023. So it's still a couple years out, 
but they already have some really interesting goals and really uh, cool stuff that they're going to do with this spacecraft. So its main thing that it's doing, Pace is up there and it's looking down at the clouds and the ocean. And it uses color specifically to measure things like phytoplankton. Is that something you've heard of before? Phytoplankton, those are like little tiny critters that live in the ocean. Think of things like, like algae, little tiny, tiny things. But when you have a whole bunch of them all smushed together, you can see them from space. It's crazy. And so here's a picture of Pace that you can see. And there's also got like a cool little diagram that shows you kind of how it's going to be using its instruments to look at the Earth. So like I said, it's sensing color. It's looking for these phytoplankton, phytoplankton. And it's using multiple wavelengths, again, just like Landsat is. It uses infrared, visible, all the way up to the ultraviolet, which is on the other side of the visible spectrum. Oh. So it can look down, not just at the top of the atmosphere, but it can look through those clouds using those other kinds of light. They can penetrate through the clouds and get all the way down to the ocean and even into the top parts of the ocean to really see how these tiny little critters are affecting things. That's pretty impressive. I think so too. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, so it's not just looking at the clouds, but it's also looking all the way down to the ocean and seeing how the different parts of this whole big column affect our climate. Now, one of the words that I want to talk about real quick while we're in here is that word aerosols, because that's something that kind of confuses people sometimes. A lot of us as humans living here on the earth, we think of the word aerosol and maybe you think of something like in a can, like hairspray or bug spray or something that comes in a pressurized can like that. That's something that we often refer to as an aerosol. But in science, we think of it a little bit differently. Those are still considered aerosols, but the word aerosol to a scientist means much, much more. It's really just any sort of little particulate matter that is up in the air. So these are things like uh, pollutants, smoke, dust, and sand. Uh, things like that. So it could be any, any sort of foreign little particles that are floating around in the air are what we consider aerosols. And so when we think about it like that, we can actually look here at the earth and we've got a really cool map that shows you different kinds of aerosols that we've tracked here on the earth. That's a lot more than hairspray for sure. But you can see all each one of the different colors is a different kind of aerosol. So you can see if we kind of move around the reddish ones, that's dust. So you can see when we kind of move around, it's a lot of that red dust coming over from the Sahara Desert. It comes all the way across the ocean and hits us here in the United States. There's green areas on there that are mapping carbon and carbon dioxide, different kinds of carbon compounds. And that includes things like smoke from wildfires. And so we can use all of these different tools to look at these aerosols and see how those are affecting our climate, our earth in general, and even the uh, health of people here on the earth. I think that's just a really cool visual visualization. And you might be wondering why, if you know, we care so much about what's in the air, why are we looking at the ocean? What does the ocean have to do with our atmosphere? actually a lot because there's this thing called ocean atmospheric exchange which basically just means that the water in our atmosphere sometimes ends up in the ocean the water in our ocean can evaporate up into the atmosphere it's a whole cycle maybe you learned about the water cycle when you were in school and you know that rain becomes ocean water which evaporates and becomes clouds which becomes rain again and so the ocean and the atmosphere are constantly cycling through air or through uh, water, which also means that all of these pollutants that end up in the air also end up in the ocean. And all of the pollutants in the ocean can also end up in the air. So it's a big cycle that keeps going and going. And so by studying both and how they interact, we get a much more complete picture of how this all works. So it's a really important thing that we have to do. Look at those swirls, aren't those pretty? 
And I'm betting a lot of this affects humans too, right? So we probably maybe want to study that effect to some capacity. You are absolutely right, Miss Amanda. Excellent transition. Thank you. Because <laughs> our third satellite that we wanted to talk about is what I think is probably the coolest one. It's my favorite of these ones that are coming up. And this one is called Maya, M-A-I-A, which of course stands for Multi-Angle Imager for Aerosols. Here's a picture of Maya there. Maya is going to launch in 2022, so just about a year from now. Now, the thing about Maya that I think is so cool is that this is the first collaboration that NASA has done between NASA scientists and a satellite working with epidemiologists, which are just like people that study diseases. That's what an epidemiologist is. So NASA specifically is working with people who study and understand diseases to figure out how we can use satellite information and studying our atmosphere and directly relate that to public health. And so Maya is going to be pulling lots and lots of information. And this is just an example of one of the things that Maya can look at. Now, again, Maya is going to be looking at those same aerosols, smoke and pollution and carbon dioxide and things like that, and looking at how it affects humans. This map here in particular is one that was made by a different satellite, but Maya sends a, uh, intends to take the same sort of data. And this in particular is looking at the... Uh, different places around the world and how much of their population deaths can be attributed directly to respiratory problems, problems with breathing. Because of course, breathing things like smoke and pollution and carbon dioxide is really bad for you, right? We, well, we're pretty sure about that. It can be really bad for your health and it's not just going to make your lungs sick. It can also make all other parts of your body sick too, your heart, your brain, all sorts of things. So the quality of the air around you has a really important effect on your health. And so NASA scientists and these epidemiologists are going to use this satellite to look at how these airborne particles affect your health on short terms, like weeks and months. They're also looking on longer terms, like years. And then they also specifically are looking at how the air quality around you affects pregnant women and how that can help, you know, uh, with developing your baby, but also just the women that are pregnant too. So it's not just looking at what's in the air and not even just where the stuff is in our atmosphere, but also how it affects people. And this is a really interesting thing that NASA is doing. I think a lot of people think of NASA satellites and they think, what does this have to do with me? This doesn't really help me very much. But in this case, it does. It's really kind of bringing it into the real world. Not that astronomy is not real world, but it brings it home, I think, and helps you really connect with it. So those are the three upcoming satellites that we think are super cool that we wanted to show you guys. Um, we also... Uh, do we have any questions come through while we're waiting? We're going to give it just a second here. Yeah, or maybe did you have a one of the three satellites where any of those stand out to you? Did you have a favorite yeah. hearing about any of those? Yeah, um, we always like to hear that. Yeah, we love looking to the future. Uh, we love hearing your guys' opinions. So give us anything you've got. Yeah. And of course, these are not the only satellites that are being launched in the near future. There's tons and tons and tons of them. It was hard to pick just three, but these were my three favorites that I thought were super cool. I've always loved the ocean. I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid. So I like things that are studying the oceans and the atmospheres and things like plankton and all sorts of stuff like that. Anybody else have a favorite? What do you think, Amanda? Which is your favorite? You know, I, I think I have to agree with you. I, I think I like the Maya satellite, um, just the fact that, and, and I agree with that little point that you said at the end there too. I think a lot of people, when they think NASA, they think about any other planet except the earth, but NASA does a lot of earth observing. We gave you a whole link to go check out a bunch of the stuff that they do. And the fact that, you know, we're, we're really getting down to that even smaller scale of not only how is some of this affecting um, just humans in general, but, you know, we can go 
all the way down to seeing how much pollution is on your block. So yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. And you know what, in case you missed the first couple episodes of this particular series, Amanda, can we show them how many Earth observing satellites are out there circling around us right now? Yeah, sure. Let's get a list of satellites pulled up. See, Emily likes Maya too. I think that is just super cool. I'm excited for that. You can also go online to the NASA websites and look at all of these different satellites too. And many of them have some really cool demonstrations, uh, really cool pictures that you can look at, stuff like that. So I highly recommend those too. Still got I'm circling around here. What do you guys think? Do you think we have a lot of satellites? A medium amount of satellites? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess how many satellites there are around the Earth right now? Well, here's a good question that came through. Do you think these kind of satellites have or can say li save lives? I think they absolutely can. I don't... Uh, I don't know of any specific examples where they have. I don't know if that's something that's ever really been tracked, um, but they absolutely have the power to do so. Like we were just talking about the Maya satellite that's gonna specifically be looking at how pollutants affect people's health. That's a really important one. But we also have satellites kind of like, we talked about some of these last week too, um, satellites that are looking at things like sea level rise. That may not seem like a thing that directly affects humans, but you have to think about humans that live like on the coasts, people that live in places like Miami. If they get sea level rise, even just a couple inches or up to a foot, that could just really cause a lot of problems for people that um, maybe not directly to their health, but they definitely have to move away. They'd be displaced, which can have hazards to your health, depending on where you have to go. That's a lot of stress that causes people could die from some of this flooding in the sea level rise. So by tracking these things, um, it helps us understand where people might be vulnerable and how we can uh, protect them or save them. We can also use them to use these satellites to track things like hurricanes or wildfires, stuff like that um, helps us kind of predict where these things are going to happen or at least have advanced warning. So if a hurricane's coming towards you, we have satellites that can say, watch out, you should probably leave your home. Or we can watch, you maybe remember the big wildfires in Colorado from last summer. We have satellites that tracked those so we could get an idea of how they were spreading and where they were going. It can also help us do things like find displaced people. If there was, you know, uh, like there was a giant hurricane that hit Puerto Rico and all of the power went out on the whole island for months. It took months for them to restore power to everybody on the island, but we could use these satellites to look down and see where the different uh, areas were where people didn't have power still. And so we could, it was much easier than trying to, you know, trek through the jungle and find random little villages. We could use satellites to look down on them from above and they're much easier to see. So that's a couple of the things that we do with these satellites that really directly help people. Let's see, we had another question here. Do satellites that study Earth from space help us learn thing about things about other planets too? They sure do. Because learning about Earth does tell us a little bit about other planets and vice versa. Learning about other planets can help us learn about uh, more about our Earth. It's a, actually a field we call comparative planetology. Some people do this for a living, just compare planets to each other. So yeah, learning more about the Earth can tell us about the other planets in our solar system that are similar to Earth, or possibly planets that are similar to Earth that are far from our solar system, around other stars. So the more that we learn about any planet, it really just adds to our whole bank of knowledge of what we know about all planets, which is pretty exciting. Here's a good one. How many satellites are looking at Earth versus other things in the universe? That is a great question. I don't know the numbers exactly off the top of my head, but knowing how many satellites are looking down at the Earth, it's a lot. Hundreds of them. 
You can see Amanda's put some of them up here. These are some satellites that are orbiting around the Earth. And it's not all just NASA satellites. That's the other thing you have to remember. It's not just scientists looking down at the Earth. There's satellites up there that are uh, used for GPS. There are some that are up there for military purposes, not just the US, but countries all over the world are launching military satellites. These are used for communication, for uh, against science purposes too, all sorts of stuff. So there are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of satellites looking down at the earth for many different reasons. Now there's a good number of satellites that are up and orbiting the earth that are looking at other things like the moon or the sun or other planets or even farther out into the universe. But there, there are many fewer of them, mostly just because they're not as practical for people. Again, looking down at the earth, we're using them for all sorts of stuff, communications and internet and GPS and all sorts of that. But see, Amanda's even put up some more satellites there that are orbiting around the earth. So there's tons and tons and tons of them. And we just don't have quite as many that are looking at other things because it's not quite as practical. There's not as many uses outside of just pure scientific research for those sorts of things. Look at all those, tons and tons. Do we have any other questions that came through? If not, we do have a very special thing that we reserved for the end of our show here today, at the end of our time, because we are sad to say this is the last Dome to Home show that we're going to have ever. This is not just the end of our season. This is not just the end of the month and this earth facing segment, but this is our last dome to home. When we first started this at the beginning of the COVID shutdown, this was our way of still reaching out to you guys and bringing you content and education and astronomy without having to go anywhere. We're all stuck in our homes, but we still want to bring you fun, cool science stuff. Now that things are starting to open back up a little more, we're very excited to be welcoming you back into Fisk very soon. We don't know the exact date yet, but we'll keep you posted. But for now, we've decided that this will be the end of our Dome to Home series. Now, these videos are still going to be available on YouTube, so you can go back and watch all of them. They'll be here forever. If you ever have any questions or comments, you can still drop those in the comment sections of these videos, and we will still respond to you. But and since you've since you've been seeing about this same few of us as usual, we thought it would be a neat little sentiment if we all popped on the same Zoom channel. So let's go ahead and have everybody turn on their video and we can all say hello to you guys. Yes. The whole Dome to Home crew. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hello. So we all just wanted to say hi and give you a quick thank you. And I am super excited that I've been able to do this Dome to Home project. This has been so fun. It's a highlight of the week every week because I love talking to you guys about all of this amazing space stuff. Um, it has been super fun and I really enjoy getting to do Dome to Home. And, uh, you know, I guess we could maybe all have something to say if you want to. I guess like one thing that I would want to say to you guys is um, just keep asking questions and always be curious because in this last 14 months that I've been doing Dome to Home with you guys, I've learned a lot and I've learned some really cool stuff, um, things that I never thought I would know. And I'm glad I got to share them with you and I'm glad we got to go through it together. So keep asking questions and stay curious. Um, I'll say something. My One of my biggest passions is sharing astronomy with other people, and I have really enjoyed being able to do that either in front of the camera or behind the scenes with everyone on this Zoom call and everyone watching at home. Um, and I've also learned a lot of techniques on how to better share astronomy with other people. So thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you all so much for watching. I had an absolute blast doing this. Um, this is the sort of stuff, just talking astronomy and teaching people and being excited and helping other people get excited is something I've wanted to do since I was a kid. And it's just super exciting that I got to do it here with all of you. Um, even in these trying times, we got to find some, some fun stuff with it. So thank you so much for watching. Hi everyone. 
I'm really glad that we got to have this experience, and I'm so proud of our team, uh, all of these wonderful faces and more who've been able to join us on the Dome to Home program. I think that this is an amazing accomplishment that we've been able to bring you so much about space and Earth uh, just through our little YouTube channel. And if you enjoyed it, uh, or if there's a particular episode you really liked, I really hope you put in the, in the comments down below, since this is our last video, please tell us what your favorite video was that we've done, uh, what you've learned, some way in which we feel like, uh, you feel like we might've impacted your lives. But I think this has been a really wonderful experience. So I'm glad that we uh, made this foray into YouTube. And if you don't remember all the different episodes and all the different topics that we have covered, Jeremy has you. Yeah. So hello, everybody. Jeremy, I can't believe this is the last time <clears throat> I get to visit you through the YouTube verse. Um, yeah, everyone really did a good job summing it up. I've had a absolute blast on this series. It's been, you know, a highlight in my week every single week. And I've loved coming back and seeing you guys, all your returning fans and all you new fans come in and, you know, commenting and interacting with us. And maybe I don't think I ever made it that explicit, but almost every week I tried to have a different background, which represented the shows that we have done. So I'm going to go all the way back. And I, I just looked and it was April 8th when our promo for the original Dome to Home came out of last year. So it's been more than a year that we've been doing this. And I thought it'd be fun to just kind of take a, a, a little step back through time and learn about all the things that we've learned. We started by talking about night skies and constellations and then how to take astrophotography uh, or do how to perform astrophotography. We had the comet Neowise pass by in the summer, which you can see here in a picture that I took that I, uh, using the tools that I learned in the astrophotography thing that we did. We went on and we learned about different patterns that we see in our solar system, like how the moon you know, looks at different times throughout a month or a month, or how the stars trail over the night sky. We took a look at meteor showers and what they mean, because I didn't even really know all the stuff that we have, I've learned from my fellow uh, Fiskers through the meteor shower shows and even from some of the members of the public, some of you guys. We took a look, a deep dive into Mars, and uh, we learned about ices and water that they have on the Mars and about the Mars atmosphere, how it's only 1% the thickness of Earth's atmosphere, but there is an atmosphere. We learned about how the sun is stripping that atmosphere away. And of course, we had a Halloween special, and I made a little Mars jack-o'-lantern. So if you haven't seen that episode, go back because I was bouncing around like that. I was having lots of fun for that one. Other things that we did in the summer that I wasn't able to participate in were we studied the climates of Venus, Earth, and Mars and how they all compare. We got to celebrate a birthday, a Hubble anniversary. I know, I, th I think Nick and maybe Rainy were on that one. That was a great show. We got to learn about all the cool images that Hubble has taken over the years. We did tours of the solar system. We went to all the different planets. We studied black holes. We learned about the summer solstice. We learned what rainbows were and how light interacts when it moves through different uh, materials in space. Uh, we learned about dark matter, which that was another one. I learned a lot from that episode because I didn't know what dark matter even really was. We learned about galaxies and the universe and things like this about how when you use different types of light galaxies, you, they look different. We learned about oddball galaxies like this fluffer galaxy, I think is what it's called, or a fluffy galaxy. And like I said, I didn't know these galaxies existed before the Dome to Home series. We learned about how we make observations and look out into the depths of the cosmos using old telescopes and new telescopes. We did special series on the moon. We, of course, as I mentioned, we did the special Perseverance rover, which is now landed on Mars and they just flew a helicopter for the second time on Mars. So if you wanna learn more about that, go back and check out those. We saw an event that has not happened in 800 years at night. We saw the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. We were able to bring that live special to you guys. We were able to look at our stars, our sun, 
and what happens when they die in these great big supernovas or maybe baby supernovas or kind of as they blow off their atmospheres and create something like the ring nebula. Then we went deep into exoplanets and we learned about all the crazy wacky worlds that are out there and imagined what type of surfaces some of those could actually hold. We learned how to observe exoplanets and how the transit method works and all the other methods. We got a special, uh, we got to celebrate a special Earth Day with you guys. And we got to study the water and the atmosphere of the place we hold so dear to our hearts and what makes it even possible for us to be here doing the show for you. We looked at water in our solar system at all the comets and all the icy moons that Terra loves so much to talk about and study but then also even water and its different forms here on our own planet. And that is about everything I think that we covered over the course of a year. I cannot believe how far we've come. If you go back and watch those, some of those first videos, I don't know how we even were figuring out how to live stream, but you guys, all you fans are what made it possible and you guys what made, gave us the motivation to come back each week and learn how to be better for you guys and how to be better for ourselves and everyone in our societies. And so for that, thank you so, so much. I had a blast. Thank you, Jeremy. That was amazing. And again, thank all of you so much. We were so happy to spend every week with you. We hope you enjoyed it too. Again, drop us some comments, send us some emails, check out the Fisk website for other cool stuff that we're doing. And I think that's all we've got for you. So thank you again, and hopefully we will see you at Fisk very soon. And let's go ahead and just end this the same way we started, by standing on Farron Field. So there we go, Farron Field. We all know what it looks like. Let's do one last lay down. Look up at the sky. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.